Well, if I may, let me spend a few moments recapping last week's sermon. If you'll remember, we're in Passion Week. Jesus and the disciples have left the city. They're walking across and starting to climb the Mount of Olives. The disciples look back and they see the temple complex gleaming in the afternoon sun. It's majestic. It's amazing. 46 years in Roman money has built a monument to architecture. And they say, look at these gorgeous buildings, almost with a measure of pride. Don't we have the best-looking city and the best-looking temple? Isn't it amazing, Jesus? Have you ever seen anything so beautiful? Which is kind of a funny question to ask. And Jesus says, you have no clue, do you? See those buildings? Not one stone will remain standing upon another. Jerusalem will be destroyed and the temple will be raised to the ground. And in verse 3 of chapter 24, we see their shocking response. Look at it with me. Tell us, when will these things happen? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? It's almost like they're falling all over each other. The questions are coming out so quickly. Three rapid-fire questions. When will these things happen? What will be the sign of your coming? What will be the sign of the end of the age? But upon closer review, we realized that there weren't three questions, but actually two, because there was only one definite article, one the, you might say, for the last two questions. And so it actually reads like this. What will be the sign of your coming and the end? To 21st century Christians, it sounds like two radically different questions. When will Jerusalem be destroyed? And when will be your second coming? That's the terminology we use, isn't it? But to a first century Jew, that's not at all what they're asking. You see, Jesus hadn't gone anywhere yet. He has yet to go to the cross, so there's no concept of Him coming back. The fall of Jerusalem, if it would ever fall, was actually, in their minds, inextricably linked to the coming of the Messiah as a conquering king. You see, they remembered the prophetic words from Zechariah. That Jerusalem would fall one day, but it was going to be at the day of the Lord. We talked about that, that terminology that's used so often in the Old Testament. That when the king was going to come to set up his kingdom, there would be a time of judgment, a day of the Lord. In a Jew's mind, there are only two ages. There's the present age and the age to come. The age in which things are right now and the kingdom age. If Jerusalem's going to fall, well, surely that's going to be the end as we know it. So they're really asking, Lord, when are you going to set up your kingdom? If if Jerusalem's going to fall, tell us when. What will be the signs? How will we know it is time? But of course, Jerusalem did fall, didn't it? AD 70, Rome raised it to the ground under general and then quickly emperor Titus Vespasian. Daniel predicted it 500 years earlier. Write down the reference, Daniel chapter 9, verse 26. Don't turn there yet. We're going to turn there in a bit. Daniel prophesied about the fall of Jerusalem. Then after 62 weeks, it's literally 62 sevens, the Messiah will be cut off and have nothing, and the people of the prince who is to come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. Well, everyone knows that Jerusalem was destroyed and the people of the prince who is to come is Titus and the Roman army. Isn't it amazing, just as a side note, how specific the Word of God is? How accurate the prophecy? And so as we looked at the first 14 verses of Matthew 24, we had to say, well, certainly Jesus is answering the first question regarding the fall of Jerusalem, but it is clearly more than that. Jesus is talking to believers. Believers who might be easily misled or shaken 
if they don't know how to rightly understand the times and the signs of His coming. Because there's going to be imposters and false Christs and wars and rumors of wars and earthquakes and famines. And if you know things are going to get worse prior to the King's coming, Christians could easily be rattled, shaken, fearful and nervous, and they might unwittingly grasp on to the wrong thing or follow the wrong person, and Jesus doesn't want that. And so He says, hey, settle down. Things are going to get bad, but those are merely, do you remember the term He used? Birth pains. What do birth pains tell us? Baby's coming. Does it tell us when? Not so much. Could be quickly, could be a while, but they're just birth pains. The end is near, but the end is not yet here. That's a good way to remember the Olivet Discourse in chapter 24. The end is near, but the end is not yet here. You can even think about in our own recent history. If we didn't know the Word of God and we didn't understand uh, the signs prior to Christ's second coming, we could easily be led astray. In fact, many were. Think about World War I. The war to end all wars. How horrific was that war? Surely this is the end. But yet it wasn't. What about the Third Reich? Could anything be more horrific than Hitler himself? Yet that was not the end. Think about earthquakes. There does seem to be an increase in earthquakes. I don't ever remember in my lifetime, nor my parents, nor my grandparents' lifetime, ever hearing of an earthquake that caused a tsunami that killed 200,000 people. If I didn't know my Bible, those are the kind of things that I would be fearful, misled, shaken, and would want to follow perhaps someone who shouldn't be followed, or grasp on to a, a, a theological understanding that was not biblically sound. Jesus says, don't be misled. Don't be shaken. Well, as we look at the Olivet Discourse, Matthew 24 and 25, there's a couple things to remember. This is not going to be exhaustive. I'm not going to address every detail. I'm going to frustrate at least everyone sometime during this six-week series. I'm not going to give you enough of the details that you want for those who really love details. And then I'm going to give you more than you want for those who, frankly, don't often think about the return of Christ. And it's going to be good for us. It's going to be good for us on both sides of the coin. What we're going to try to understand out of this private sermon that Christ gives His disciples is what, one, what can every Christian agree upon regarding prophecy? Generally, and there's going to be some differences as far as where the text breaks or, or when he's talking about Jerusalem and when he's talking about the future. But generally, what can Christians agree on regarding Christ's return? Secondly, what should every Christian's response be to prophecy? That's probably going to be the biggest change, not so much for us, but for, for uh, Christians in general regarding prophecy. We've oftentimes uh, amassed a, a huge amount of information, especially if you've been through a series on Revelation, and then don't do anything with it except speculate. Or, or, or don't do anything with it except sit around and talk about it. Or argue about which, which uh, order of events you agree with and don't agree with, and can you believe someone believes that and doesn't believe this, and how silly, and they're all nuts, and vice versa. And they're missing the main point of prophecy, which is what? be holy, to be ready, and to be about the work of the Lord. So just so I'm managing expectations. If you want to think about last week, sort of the theme, it's about birth pains. Don't be misled, the end is not here yet. This week then is the beginning of the end. The title of the sermon, The Abomination of Desolation. And our timeless truth is this, believers are to recognize the times, be ready to run and remember, God is in control. Three points will divide our time. Number one, run when you see this sign. You're like, Pastor, I've never been to a prophecy conference like that where we're, we're learning about when to run. Yeah, but I'm going to teach the text. 
we're going to wrestle with what the text says, not with our own framework over the text. Number two, remember God is in control. And three, recognize the times. Let's dive right in. Run when you see this sign. Verse 15. Therefore, when you see the abomination, abomination of desolation, which was spoken of through Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, let the reader understand, then those who are in Judea must flee to the mountains. Now let's talk about this abomination of desolation. Your version should have it in all caps. What does that mean? That means we've seen it before, and it's probably in the Old Testament. That's what all caps means there. It's an Old Testament Scripture reference. In fact, this one is given for us. What does it say? It's from Daniel the prophet. Daniel uses this phrase three times in his book. Three times on prophecy. And each time has to do with two basic things. One, stopping sacrifice and desecrating the holy place. Stopping sacrifice and desecrating the holy, holy place. It literally means the abomination that causes desolation. Now hang with me here. The abomination that causes des desolation. And I want to give you a, a, a good working definition. It is the willful, blasphemous, idolatrous desecration of worship intended to persecute God's people. I'll say it again. It is the willful, blasphemous, idolatrous desecration of worship intended to persecute God's people. Now this seems to have been fulfilled in 168 B.C. If you don't like history... I want to help you like it today, okay? <laughs> because this is very, very important and interesting. If you'll remember last week, I mentioned the name Antiochus Epiphanes, appearing of the glorious one. And we talked about how the Jews mocked him. Do you remember what they called him? Mr. Epimenes, appearing of the madman. Let me tell you a little bit about this madman. In order to understand this abomination of desolation that took place in 168 B.C., we have to understand this Antiochus Epiphanes. You've got to go back a little bit further to Alexander the Great, who conquered the known world before the age of 30, but of course died without any heirs and left how many generals in his place? Four. Now, if you get this, you get bonus points, right? Who are the four generals? Anyone? Anyone? Lysimachus? Cassander, Ptolemy, and Seleucus. Ptolemy and Seleucus are the ones we recognize the most. So Israel was sort of between the hammer and the anvil. Uh, the Seleucids were from Syria, kind of northeast. The Ptolemies were in Egypt. Israel's in the center. They were always vying to sort of control Israel. Plus remember, Israel, the king's highway, goes right through it. So during this time, a couple hundred years before Christ, they're constantly being oppressed by one or the other. Antiochus Epiphanes was a Seleucid. And he sought, after a period of time, to destroy the Jews. To just crush them into obedience. He did what was called a seven-year reign of terror, where he persecuted them, and he instituted what was called Hellenization. He basically said, I hate you guys so much, I'm going to make you Greek. Is there anything more cruel that you could do to a Jew than to try to make him something other than Jewish? Right? So listen to what he did. He said, you're no longer allowed to be a Jew. Period. You're not a Jew. You can't possess the Torah. He took away their Bibles. He made the Jewish boys exercise in the nude like Greek boys just humiliated the Jews, and watch this, and I don't understand this, he instituted the uncircumcision of Jewish men. As if that wasn't horrific enough, he then commits the abomination of desolation. He shows up in Jerusalem. He walks into the temple. He kills a pig. He pulls the guts out of the pig and spreads them all over the Holy of Holies blasphemous, willful, idolatrous desecration of a place of worship. Why? To 
crush the Jews' morale. As if that wasn't enough, he then sets up an idol of Zeus in the Holy of Holies. There is no question in any Jew's mind, there's no question in any historian's mind, that that was an abomination of desolation. The question is, is that the abomination of desolation that Christ talks about here? I think we would have to say no. Why? Because though I believe it fulfilled uh, the prophet Daniel's prophecy, Jesus has said, don't be misled, but when you see future, the abomination of desolation, now it's time to run. So I think whatever this abomination of desolation is, it's still to happen in the future. Now, if you will, go ahead and turn to Daniel chapter 9, and let's look at these verses, and we're going to answer some of the questions, but not enough to get us off track on the purpose of prophecy. Ezekiel, Daniel. Daniel chapter 9 and verse 26. Now, I've already read verse 26, but I want to read it again as a precursor to 27. It says, Then after 62 sevens, we would say maybe 483 years is the way you would naturally read it, the Messiah will be cut off and have nothing. And the people of the prince who is to come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. Now what's interesting, if you read the previous verse, it talks about from the going forth of the command to rebuild Jerusalem. We know that was during the time of Nehemiah. Uh, I think probably the best date is March 4th, 444 B.C. Until Messiah has come. You're, you're pretty close to that time. Some theologians would say exactly that time. But here's the key. The Messiah will be cut off, which happened, and the city and the sanctuary will be destroyed. So it appears that some, if not all of verse 26, has been fulfilled. Which, just side note here, do you have any Jewish friends? Take them to lunch. Take them to Daniel chapter 9, verse 26. Tell me about this Messiah you're waiting on. Ask them some questions. Show them Daniel. Everyone knows the city and the sanctuary was destroyed in AD 70, and here it says the Messiah was cut off. Hey, the Messiah has already come. It's a great conversation killer. I mean, opener. Verse 27, now watch this. And he will make a firm covenant with the many for one week, but in the middle of the week he will put a stop to sacrifice and grain offering, and on the wing of abominations will come one who makes desolate. Even until a complete destruction, one that is decreed is poured out on the one who makes desolate. Now, I don't understand all the details here. This is one of the most difficult passages. There's a bunch of different views. Some believe that the temple in Jerusalem will be rebuilt. And that seems to be a normal reading, but I've also heard other interpretations. To be fair, it's hard to know. But here's what we do know. The abomination of desolation that Christ talks about in Matthew chapter 24 has yet to happen. And the wars and the rumors of wars and the impostors and the false prophets and the false Christs, those are birth pains. But when you see the abomination of desolation, whatever this is, that's the beginning of the end. So, what is this? I'm going to rely on our definition. It's the willful, blasphemous, idolatrous desecration of worship in order to persecute God's people. I don't think we know exactly. I think we can speculate. I think you can have strong convictions. I think you can say, hey, this is what I think it is. But what it appears to be is something that will be without question an abomination that causes desolation. We'll know it. And when that happens, that's the beginning of the end. The birth pains are over, and now we're in a time of tribulation like this world has never, ever seen before. The return of the king is right around the corner. Let me take a step back. Can you see I'm continually pushing us towards the purpose of prophecy? Christ is continually pushing us towards the purpose of prophecy. Don't be easily misled or shaken, but yet don't be caught unprepared. That's verses 1 through 14. 
Now, he says, when you see this power grab involving the willful defilement for the purpose of persecuting God's people, that's the beginning of the end. Now, did you catch? I just added something in there. I said this willful, what did I say? Power grab. Power grab. That is what is driving the abomination of desolation. That is why Antiochus Epiphanes did what he did. It was the same sin of Satan. I shall be like the, what? Most high. I want to be worshipped. I think a normal understanding is that while there will be false Christs and imposters, there will rise an antichrist. Someone who wants to be worshipped. And it's going to first start out by deception, and then it's going to end up crushing those whom he's misled. Paul seems to expand upon this concept in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3. Let no one in any way deceive you, for it will not come unless the apostasy comes first, and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction, who opposes, and watch this, and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, displaying himself as being God. It makes no difference whether it's a real temple or not. We don't understand all those details. But someone is going to take the place of Christ. And people are going to blindly follow Him. And this all seems to correlate to this concept of Antichrist or also called the beast. Spoken about in Revelation 13. And he opened his mouth in blasphemies against God to blaspheme His name and his tabernacle, that is, those who dwell in heaven. It was also given to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them, and authority over every tribe and people and tongue and nation was given to him. Whatever this is, whatever this is, we've got enough of a working definition to understand that those are birth pains, this is the time to run. And then that's what Christ says. Verse 17, And when you see this happen, don't even go downstairs. He's talking about a Palestinian home where where the men would go up on the roof in the cool of the evening and spend the rest of the hours before they would go to sleep. The picture here is don't even go downstairs. Run from rooftop to rooftop to get out of the city. Don't even go back to get your coat if you're in the field. Was this the same for Jerusalem's fall in AD 70? Absolutely. Absolutely. There were people who were enjoying the night air and then had to run. History records the horrific nature of the fall of Jerusalem. One million Jews slaughtered. One million Jews. I'm pretty sure today, I don't remember the last population count, but I want to say there's only like, is it six million in Israel today? So for one million to be taken out in the first century, that's amazing. People were starving. People fell into grotesque activities. Parents started to embrace cannibalism. 97,000 were carted off as slaves. I think 70,000 of those built the Colosseum. Titus celebrated his victory by building the Titus Arch that you see in the Forum in Rome. Jesus says, pray that it doesn't happen on a Saturday on the Sabbath when you'll be restricted, or pray that you, it doesn't happen in winter, or, or that you're, you're not pregnant at the time. Yet as bad as that was, and it was horrific, one commentator says it well, there seems to be a link between this and the end of the age. One seems to be a foreshadowing of what will even be worse. Verse 21 confirms that. Turn back to Matthew chapter 24. For then there will be a great tribulation such as has not occurred since the beginning of the world until now, nor ever will. Daniel chapter 12 verse 1, Now at that time Michael, the great prince who stands guard over the sons of your people will arise and there will be time of distress such as has never occurred since there was a nation until that time. Are things going to get better? We don't talk a lot about theological systems here. 
pretty tough to be what's called post-millennial. We ain't going to usher in the kingdom. Your social justice is not going to make everything better and make people nicer. Hey, if people like you, they're not going to like Jesus more. There's only one saving thing, and that is the gospel that is wrapped in uh, clay vessels that we kindly, graciously entreat people to come and bow the knee to Christ, but realize things are going to get worse. When it talks about the apostasy coming first, that's not talking about pagan apostasy. Apostasy means without faith, the punting of faith. Pagans never had it. They never claimed to have it. It's talking about the church. It appears that the visible church is going to dwindle. Can you see how that might happen with the overabundance of political correctness in our world today? Can you see how people who who seem to love the Word of God and love God's people and go to church and are involved might have a tendency to withdraw when someone starts to twist their arm at work and says, you better come in line or you're not going to get a paycheck. When their family starts to mock them. I heard of a great conversation this week where where this, this, this man was interested about the things of Christ. But do you know what was holding him back? Generation after generation after generation of unbelief in his family. If I believe what you're telling me, do you realize what will happen to me? Do you realize what I'm saying about my parents, my grandparents, my great-grandparents? Do you realize what this will cost me? Christ says, yes, I do. But he who is not willing to pick up his cross, deny himself, is not worthy to be my disciple. Look, we're in the buckle of the Bible belt. Amen? I mean, what's funny is this sort of this double standard. You know, I talk with pastor friends around the country and sometimes overseas. And, and what, your church is this size? Really? In Dallas? Shouldn't it be like this big? It's like, well, where are you? Well, I'm in, I'm in Ireland. How big is it? It's small. But I'm in Ireland. No one believes here. Huh. So who's seeing it wrongly? I think sometimes I'm seeing it wrongly. I think we assume everyone believes here, but there's no, there's no weightiness, there's no persecution to test our faith. Things are going to get worse. In fact, Christ here talking to believers says it's going to get worse than it's ever been before. Whoa, pastor. Whoa. I didn't think we were going to be here for the, uh, the Great Tribulation. I've seen the movies. It, it, uh, it doesn't end that way. I've seen all the movies. It doesn't end that way. Okay, not the point of this passage, but probably on several people's minds. I think I heard amen. Problem is, is now we're back to talking about order of events. Great to have a strong conviction on those things. I want you to. But do you remember the rule if we're going to go there? It's a third tier issue. It's not something we divide over. When I came to Metro in 2005, the order of events was actually in our doctrinal statement. And over a period of time, I I petitioned the elders to remove it. This is not a salvific issue and this is not a fellowship issue. This is a third tier issue. It does not need to be in our doctrinal statement. So we removed it. But before I answer that question, briefly, not exhaustively, let me make a couple of points just to educate ourselves. Rapture is not a word we see in Scripture. It's a Latin word that means to be caught up. That said, it is a concept we do see in Scripture, clearly. And remember, we're looking at what all Christians believe and then how all Christians are to respond. And Jesus, who came first as a suffering servant, will return as a conquering king, watch this, to rescue the righteous, or we could say redeemed, and bring judgment to those who remain in rebellion. Paul specifically talks about this in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain, will be, what? Caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we shall always be with with the Lord. Therefore, 
comfort one another with these words. Our believers who are alive at the return of our King, will they be caught up to be with Him? Yes. As one friend used to tell me, all Christians believe in the rapture. We just disagree on the timing. We all believe that we will be caught up. So back to the question, whoa, 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 I didn't think we were going to be here for the tribulation. All Christians believe in a first coming, amen? All Christians believe in a second coming. All Christians believe that those who are alive when He returns will be caught up. Some believe that that catching up will be at an additional coming, a different time. A different time from His return to conquer and judge. Now there are about five different views there we're not going to go through today. I'll be glad to go through them in our uh, equipping hour class on the timing of the rapture. And they all range from about seven years out to three and a half years out to a year out to just a little bit before. We're talking about a seven year period. As my professor in eschatology at Dallas Theological Seminary, which by the way is decidedly pre-trib, explained all are arguments from logic. Good arguments from logic, but nonetheless, logical arguments. The concept of an additional coming is based upon several factors, but for the purposes of our text, I'll cover one of them today. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 9 says, For the Lord has not destined us for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. The thought is this, for those who believe that Christians will be caught up in an additional uh, coming, a secret coming, you might say, some people say, or, or a stage one of His second coming, believe that that is true because Christians are not destined for wrath. Well, that sounds good. The only problem is, is that that same word is used by Paul just a few chapters earlier in the same book and it says, chapter 1, verse 10, And to wait for His Son from heaven, whom He raised from the dead, that is, Jesus, who rescues us from the wrath to come. The normal reading of that, wrath, is the final judgment. That He has rescued us from the final judgment because He paid for our sins on the cross. So it becomes a little difficult to say that that wrath means the great tribulation. Nevertheless, some people believe that. I'm not saying whether I do or not. It's worthy to note that this concept of a second coming or a coming in two stages did not come about until the 1800s. The point is this. It's not the point of the Olivet Discourse. It's not the point. I'll be glad to do the equipping hour. I'll even tell you which way I lean. I'll tell you my best arguments. I'll tell you the other best arguments. I can do them both. The key here is that we're not to be misled or shaken by birth pains. We're to recognize the abomination of desolation. We're to know that Christ's coming is around the corner. Do we know those days? No. We can surmise, we can guess, but Christ can come at any time, right? I love what Wayne Grudem says. You know, a lot of people say, well, if we know the signs, then Christ's return can't be at any time. Have you heard that argument? But I love what Grudem says. He's so good. He says, look, we see that there seems to be signs that precede Christ's return. The only problem is we may not have recognized the signs. So yes, Christ's return could come at any time. But if we do recognize the signs, we know that it is near. We don't know how near, but we know it's near. All Christians believe that the King is coming back to rescue the redeemed and to bring judgment on those who reject Him. That's a seminary class right there in and of itself, right? Our next two points are much shorter which, as I heard from a pastor this week, that's what all preachers say. But they are really short. Number two, remember God is in control. Do you think all this that we just talked about, e even the order of events and the challenges there, do you think this might rattle a Christian? Yeah, you may say, look, I'm rattled here. Christ knows that. Look at verse 22. Unless those days had been cut short, no life would have been saved. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. 
What's he saying? Hey, don't worry about this. Yes, it's going to be difficult, but Christians don't fear final judgment. Yes, things will get difficult here, but the more difficult it gets, the closer it is to my return. Hey, but above all, I'm going to cut the day short. My hand is still on the wheel. Satan is still on a short leash. I'm in control. That's why Paul can say in 1 Thessalonians, therefore, comfort one another with these words. That's why Paul can say, hey, what's the worst they can do to me? Kill me? Go for it. To live as Christ, to die as gain. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. The dead in Christ shall rise first. They're going to beat us there. Resurrection is real because His resurrection guarantees ours. He puts it in perspective. Look, Christians are never promised a life, freedom from persecution or tribulation. But what does He promise us? As I prayed, He who began a good work will complete it. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Everything happens for God's glory and your good. We don't take comfort in our circumstances. They're going to get worse. We take comfort in a sovereign, good God. Finally, recognize the times. Now, Christ is going to return. But He said, even those who see the right sign could still be misled. Verse 23, Then if anyone says to you, Behold, here's the Christ, or there He is, don't believe Him. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and will show great signs and wonders so as to mislead. If they say He's out there, don't go follow Him. If they say He is in the inner room, don't pursue it. And then he has this very interesting statement. He says, verse 27, For just as the lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so will the coming of the Son of Man be. Wherever the corpse is, there the vultures will gather. Look, Christ makes it clear you're not going to have to wonder about His return. It's not going to be a quiet event. Everyone, everyone will know. Everyone will see it. It will be what's called in the Greek a parousia. A parousia was, it was a word used to describe the coming of an emperor or the coming of a famous dignitary. It was a processional into town. There were trumpets blowing. There were crowds cheering. It was a appearing. That's the literal word. When Christ returns, it will be an appearing of the king. One commentator writes, the final coming of the Son of Man in glory and judgment will be no hole-in-the-corner affair. No, it will be the most public event in all history. It will be impossible to miss it, for it will be like lightning from one side of the sky to another. It will light up the whole place. Now imagine also with the technology we have now. Everyone will see it. It will be over all the news. I'll let you read it for your homework, but he, in verses 32 through 35, he gives a parable about a fig tree. And in Palestine, most of the trees are evergreen. So a fig tree in winter sticks out like a sore thumb. Everyone knows when summer is coming. Everyone knows when spring is here because they see the budding, the budding of a fig tree. Jesus says, understand the times so that you can be a better steward. Realize that He is near. He's right at the door, verse 33. And then in verse 34, He says, Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but My words will not pass away. Now this generation, that term, is a challenge for those who are taking uh, the, the position I'm taking. This is largely talking about the return of Christ. But the flip side of that is it, if you make it all talk about the fall of Jerusalem, you have to skip over a lot of things. You've got to skip over Christ answering uh, the, the, the question about the end of, his age, of the age and His coming. You have to skip over verses 31, uh, 30 and 31 where He talks about coming on the clouds. 
I think it's best to understand that once we see this sign of the abomination of desolation, all of this is going to happen in a very quick amount of time. We don't know the amount of time, but a very quick amount of time and within one generation, within one's lifetime. If I'm wrong, I'll be corrected when I get to heaven. And Calvin said the best theologians only write 80% of the time anyway. So, This was a very text-heavy sermon, but let me encourage you, the last three are going to be very, very, very practical. So hang with me. That said, I want to take five minutes and I want to apply this together because there is some rich gospel application here. Three questions. One, understanding this prophecy, understanding what all Christians can agree upon regarding the end of the age, the sign of His coming, a a time of tribulation that the world has never seen, and the return of Christ. Are you ready? Spiritually, I mean. Are you ready? I'm going to press this. Are you right with the Lord? It will do no good when He comes to plead to repent then. It's too late. Have you repented of your sin and placed your faith and trust in the person and work of Jesus Christ? That Jesus Christ is God a very God who came to earth, took on humanity without giving up divinity, lived the life that we couldn't live, and took our place on the cross, absorbing the just wrath of God in order that mercy might be extended. And for those who turn from their sin and place their faith and trust in Jesus Christ, sola fide, by faith alone, wrath is not destined for them. Judgment has been satisfied. Are you ready? If you're not, let me assure you, beyond the shadow of a doubt, Jesus Christ is coming back. But He is not coming back as a suffering servant this time. The price has been paid. Death has been defeated. He is coming back as a conquering king, a righteous judge. And He will rescue those whom He has redeemed and judgment will fall upon those who have continued in rebellion. Are you ready? If you are not, please, this congregation joins me in unison Deal with the estate of your soul today. Come talk to me. Talk to those around you. What did that pastor mean about bowing the knee to Christ? What does it mean to cast aside my good works or my own thoughts of trying to make my way to a right relationship with God and embrace the free gift of salvation? Are you ready? If your soul is ready, question number two, is your life ready? also ready. Meaning you are saved to be an ambassador of the kingdom, to let people know who the king is, what he did, and call them to follow him. How's that going? Because there are going to be many who are embarrassed at Christ's return. And a pocket full of excuses about a busy season in life or, or a busy career or lots of kids or, or, or yes, you know, sick whatever, dog, is not going to make a difference. Look, He saved you not just for eternity, He's giving you life and breath to do a job. You were once a slave to sin, now you are a slave to righteousness. You are a steward and the Master has gone away. You're to be about the work of ministry. You may not be able to put in 40 hours a week doing it, but you can make it the priority of all that you do. Moms, do not Neglect to disciple your children in the Word of God. Moms, do not use the discipleship of your children as an excuse not to witness and to disciple other people, other women. Men, do not abdicate your authority to be the spiritual pastor of your own home, to lead your children in prayer, to share the Word of God with them around the table. Disciple your children well, but Don't use it as an excuse to not witness to the kids down the street or to your co-workers. Are you ready? Is your life also ready? And then finally, are we ready to endure? If the Lord chooses to have us go through persecution, have we gone there in our minds? 
Or do we assume things will be as they always have been? What will you say when you're called to quit sharing your faith or else? What will you say when you're called to sign a document at work agreeing with a principle contrary to Scripture or else? What will you do when those whom you love call you to shut up about Jesus or else? This is tough, but we have got to deal with the or else's in our minds. We've got to go through them in our head. We have to walk through that tribulation. We have to hide the Word of God in our hearts because one day in the not too distant future, those may be real. Let me leave us with one thing. The early church and Scripture gave the second coming of Christ a name. Paul calls it the blessed hope. Christ has just talked about how things are going to get worse. But if we only focus on that and not the fact that His return is speeding along, we will miss the bigger picture. The blessed hope. Christ is coming back. We don't serve a dead Savior. He is coming back for His children. And lo, we will be with Him always, even until the end of this age and the eternal age. Amen.